whether scrambling up a tree, flying overhead, or happily wagging their tail at the end of your leash. Animals are everywhere. My name is Lizzie Simons and welcome to this episode of Spotlight Features where we're highlighting fuzzy friends and wonderful wildlife. We're here in the heart of Winnipeg in the beautiful Assiniboine Forest and I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Appa. The two of us have some wonderful stories to share with you from across the country about animals of all shapes and sizes, so stay tuned. There are hundreds of thousands of animals found throughout Canada, and sometimes they can be kind of hard to tell apart. One that's common throughout the prairies is often mistaken for a gopher. Can you guess what it really is? Think about it while we take a look at our first feature and meet a blind raven named Dougal. Look at you! You're a happy boy, hey? Okay? Yeah. This is a partnership. He'll keep letting me be this close to him and I'll keep him happy. <laughs> As an animal care technician, uh, you know, we, we go around and we feed and we clean certain enclosures. So Dougal is one of the ones that we take care of just because he is a special kind of raven. You want to come say hi? Come on. He was brought into the center where our Dr. Malcolm McCady, our vet that works with us, uh, looked him over and noticed that he was mostly blind. Because of that, he couldn't be out in the wild. He wouldn't be able to see where he's going. He wouldn't be able to find food. So uh, he got raised up by our, by our founder. Dougal, um, he's here to help educate people just on ravens because they're quite misrepresented out there. Man, you're showing off so much today. They're highly intelligent, you know, on the levels of like chimpanzees and dolphins, you know, like usually the intelligence level of a seven-year-old. Makes them troublemakers. They love being stimulated and they love having fun. Yeah. You know, people don't get a chance to see them up close and see the things that they do. And, and Dougal's a, a wonderful, wonderful little guy for that. Hello. And there are like 40 plus Hello. different different branches of ravens like all over the world. They inhabit pretty much every single part of it. I know, buddy. And they all have different kind of characteristics. You have some ravens that are twice the size of Dougal. You have some ravens that have big white marks, some with massive beaks. You know, they're just, they kind of come, come in all shapes, shapes and sizes. When you see a raven or a crow at a distance, you kind of think that they're the same animal. In reality, you see a raven up, up close, you see the huge differences between the two. Dougal and ravens have a nice big curved beak. Their tail feathers actually come to a soft diamond point. They're not like hunting talons. He does have some strength in them, but they're not like something he relies on for, for eating. Ravens in general, they have a wide variety of vocalizations. So almost to the point of like a parrot. And then there's stuff like this, or Dougal's dancing. He's, he's having a good time right now. <laughs> In mythology, they had the whole, yeah, uh, they had the whole legend of being the tricksters and the, the intelligent ones and all that kind of stuff. And that's very true. You know, they're fun. They're, they're good fun. They're not an omen for anything bad. They're just, uh, they're just characters. And they, each one has a very unique personality, right, buddy? Assiniboine Park is a large park located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. One of the park's main grounds is inhabited with vibrantly active critters. These critters are the Richardson's ground squirrels. The Richardson's ground squirrels are commonly mistaken as gophers or prairie dogs. Richardson's ground squirrels are named in honor of Sir John Richardson, not because he looks like them, but because he identified them. They are native to Manitoba and the Canadian prairies. Typical adults are about 30 centimeters long. The average lifespan of a Richardson's ground squirrel is three years. They like to eat seeds, fruits, vegetation, insects, and even other animal carcasses. They create hundreds of holes and burrows underground with several passages and entrances. Richardson's ground squirrels live in family groups led by females and are very territorial. They work as family groups to watch for predators. You may see them making high-pitched alarm calls when they feel a threat 
is nearby. The Richardson's ground squirrels are an entertaining bunch. Although they are considered agricultural pests, controlled humane measures allow the species to cohabitate and thrive in suburban habitats. Coming up on Spotlight Features Animals. Somebody once said that the horses take on the personality of the owner. So <laughs> I guess if that's the case, then uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a goof. <laughs> Are you a content creator looking to expand your audience and make your voice heard in your community? Shaw Spotlight wants to provide you with a platform to share your hobbies, interests, and stories, and all for free. Visit us to find out more. Agriculture is one of the largest industries in Canada, and while many people may think of farm animals as just livestock, our next features show they can often be so much more. Get ready to meet some larger-than-life farm animals. Our purpose here is to take care of nature. When I saw the possibilities and how much the goats bring people back to the land, that was, that was my feeling of happiness. My name is Kaylee Chase, and I am a goat herder. I started working with herbicide spraying. I had realized how much it repelled people from the land and from me. Like, if I was out spraying, they're like, oh, that smells terrible, and you shouldn't be spraying, and you get a lot of flack. Once we got into the goats, it just draws people to the land and it's a lot easier to teach people about the invasive plants and the problem that's here with the goats. There's so many reasons why we should be paying attention to invasive species on our lands. Uh, one of the main reasons is biodiversity. An invasive plant can come in and create a monoculture. It's not good for the soil, it's not good for the insects. The role that the goats play, they are recycling the plant matter back into the soil. We get the goats on the plants before they go to seed because the plant has already put so much energy into making the flower. And so when the goats eat that flower again, we're weakening what would be a perennial plant. They're Molars are very sharp, and so any, any seed casings that may go into their system gets chewed up quite well. Coming into the little parks, there's a benefit to that because the people really get to see what is needed in the way of um, land management and weed control. My favorite part of working with the goats is being part of Mother Nature's plan and getting to hang out with them every day, enjoying their personalities and being part of the herd. Donkeys are just so intuitive and are so drawn to humans' emotions that they will mirror your emotion. If you are feeling upset, they will be drawn to you and try to take that energy out of you and make you feel better. I've always known I've wanted donkeys, but I never really knew why. And then when I was able to rescue Coco and Winnie, and I just wasn't happy in the job I was doing, and I was trying to figure out what my purpose was, I sort of just sat there with them, and they were just both staring at me. It just came to me. It just, they just, it's like they were telling me what their purpose, what they wanted to do. They wanted to work too, and we were both searching a purpose together. And then it came to me like a whisper that, why not work with my donkeys? Well, Coco's the oldest. Coco's eight years old, and Winnie is four years old. And Coco is definitely the alpha female, and Winnie is definitely the baby. And she follows Coco completely everywhere. I provide the animal assisted therapy where clients will come and they'll just hang out in the paddock with the donkeys. We go on donkey hikes and it's about a two hour hike and it's just adjacent to their paddock. The client is able to walk them on a lead and we don't have to talk or do anything, we're just one with nature. In the UK, it's huge, they use donkeys for animal therapy 
for decades. And when I finally rescued my two donkeys, I realized it when I was hanging out with them. They were totally in tune to me. They, if I was upset about something, they just, they suck the energy out of you t until you are feeling calm again. They just give off this sense of, of peace pandemic and such there's always like just a little under the skin little prickles of worry and whatever you know this gives you an hour or an hour and a half or whatever of just not even thinking about it you can just do something that's completely unrelated to what anything else is going on in the world right now and you can just be around these beautiful girls and it's it makes you feel better oh coco and winnie are totally like family yes they're part of the family they hang out with my dogs and my cats and yeah they're just not allowed in the house Our farm is a very special place where animals roam and it's quiet and peaceful. For a long period of time, we've had many animals on the farm and uh, we bought and sold animals, but there was always one that was very special to us. And that was Georgie. He likes that. This is Curious George. That's his full name. To his friends, he's called Georgie. Oh, you're going to give a hug. Georgie just has an affinity for people, and he's very personable, and he can make you feel like you're special to him. So he was a perfect candidate to be an ambassador. Georgie's one of our first animals. Mm. He's not necessarily the best quality fiber mm. because he's an older boy now, and he comes from genetics mm. from 16 years ago. But mm. um, as Bob said, he's a very special animal. Mm because he has an affinity for people. Hey, does that mean I get treats? <laughs> <laughs> the reason we call them Curious George because in the barn, when he was just a little tight, he kept coming around and sneaking up behind me and breathing down my neck. And I turn around and there he was, looking for trouble, looking for something to do. That's Curious George for you. Yeah, I've been, I guess I've been involved in horses pretty much all my life since I was a young fellow. I started training horses for uh, neighbors and stuff like that and found I could make some extra cash. And around 35, I started back in uh, full time, just training horses, starting colts and uh, really enjoyed it and just loved riding and going out on the trail. I love to see the potential in a horse and see what was possible from a horse and watch him develop. I loved the personalities of the horses when I was training them. And it, it really laid the groundwork for a lot of the business stuff that we do now. Uh, in the ranch, we were involved with different people, guests and staff. And a lot of those skills I learned training horses are transferable to that too. So. I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is how incredibly sensitive horses are to body language. Um, people that haven't handled horses much will just go in and walk up to the horse and is kind of surprised when he walks away or spins around and takes off or approaches. It's just, it's learning all those little nuances um, that just take time. It's not something that you can just kind of pick up and understand instantly. It's just like people. And you got to remember too, uh, horses are limited in uh, how they communicate and their body language in the herd and with people is very much what they deal in. That's their currency. And somebody once said that the horses take on the personality of the owner. So <laughs> I guess if that's the case, then uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a goof. <laughs> Let's move on to some fuzzy friends that are a little more suited to sitting in your lap. Our next couple of stories feature feline fur babies. Sorry, Appa. Send in the cats. Yes! Over. Cats actually, I think they're smarter than dogs, honestly. Yeah! It might be easier to teach a dog to do, I mean, certain things. It might have an advantage, but he actually really enjoys working. Yeah! 
nine years ago. When I got my first dog, I started training him. Yeah, I like watching them figure stuff out and also just enjoying it. Come on. Good. I wanted to learn to train a cat because I've always trained dogs. So I wanted to try something different. Go to your mat. I got Kelso at eight weeks old. What is it? When he was a kitten, I started just with the simple task of going uh, to a mat. And we do a lot of shaping. Shaping is when you have like tiny increments that lead up to the end result. For example, going to the mat, I would just click and reward him for looking at the mat first a few times, and then maybe moving towards the mat, and then eventually being on the mat, and then eventually staying on the mat. It's really different. Um, dogs, they will work for free for you. And I find the cats, they just need a little more motivation. So it's been tough. Some days he feels like working and some days he doesn't. Uh, that's why typically we try to have doubles or even triples for movies and stuff. Okay. He's auditioned for a few roles. He did a commercial when I think he was about six months old. I was in Calgary, it was like an AT&T commercial. And then he was on set for the Blue Stem commercial also. Go your mark. Good job. I don't think he could have ever been a cat that didn't have training. He actually really enjoys working. There's some days where I'm like, let's just do nothing today. And he's like sitting on me, meowing in my face because it's like boredom. He really wants to do it. I think mentally it's worked him a lot. I even do like uh, dog puzzle toys with him. He really likes those. He knows spin, he can jump through hoops, he can do relays and agility, so he can do jumps and tunnels. His favorite is boxing. That's his like signature trick. Down. Obviously he can speak, he loves to talk. <laughs> For me, like I had never trained a cat before, he was my first one. And we, I guess we just click for training actually. I do click with him. I am trying to teach him how to handstand against the wall. So he's doing pretty good with that one. Spider, spider. Good. It challenges me too to see what I'm capable of in training. Yes. Each animal's personality is different, so to be able to train each individual animal something is kind of a reward in itself. Weep, 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 weep. Yes. Over. You know, I never thought I'd ever get a cat or enjoy one. When he was a kitten, I was like, oh my god, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but I do love him a lot. I don't know what it is. My wife was playing on the internet one day, and there was an ad there saying they were looking for volunteers. Well, we had said that both of us would do it together. Like, I also volunteer for the United Church and stuff, but he's not interested in doing that kind of stuff. So this was something we could do together and got us out of the house. Hi, Bruiser. Hi, baby. My name is Wendy Black, and I'm a cat cuddler. My name is Dan Black, and I'm a cat cuddler at Second Chance Pet Network. Hello, Tabasco. Well, we've been married well over 40 years, but I want to tell you because then you'll know how old I am, but she's in heaven. She looks forward to Tuesdays like nobody's business. <laughs> I have lots of favorite cats here. I like Tabasco and Jamie, Candu, just, oh, I love Candu. Peanut, Mishka, Mustachio. There's so many. <laughs> Me personally, I'm, I'm good with cats. I don't mind cats. I'm not one that would go out and get a cat. It's not a hard job by any means, but you need to be able to spend time with all the cats, whether you like them or not. There's a couple in there, if you pet them for too long, they'll try and take your hand off at the shoulder. But you still have to, you know, just go in and, and they get better every time. Oh gosh, they're all different, for sure. <laughs> Some have attitudes and 
<laughs> catitudes and <laughs> but uh, most of them are all just lovable little things. We don't currently have a cat, no. We rent them every week. <laughs> no, no, we're not gonna bite. We're not biting, no. Such a nice little boy, yeah. So there was probably eight or 10 cats in here for the first month, they wouldn't come near us. You know, now they greet us at the door. Maybe it's the treats I have in my pocket, I don't know. <laughs> Coming up on Spotlight Features Animals. We have currently four, five, or six pregnant females or with joey females. And if you're lucky, you get to see the joeys poking their heads out uh, quite often now as they're getting larger and larger. Are you a content creator looking to expand your audience and make your voice heard in your community? Shaw Spotlight wants to provide you with a platform to share your hobbies, interests, and stories, and all for free. Visit us to find out more. As wonderful as it can be welcoming a new pet into your family, saying goodbye is never an easy task. After experiencing a tragic accident with their dog, a couple from Cranbrook, BC is sharing their story as a word of warning. I would have never imagined it. I just kind of went numb. We got River um, about a year and a half after we lost our other dog to cancer. It was just the beginning of COVID. It was just all starting, so we called him our COVID baby. We went for walks probably twice a day. He lived for them. And he just loved to run and explore and uh, discover everything. He especially loved it when we walked through the woods. He was obsessed with sticks. Um, he would get really excited, he would look for sticks, sometimes he'd grab really long ones, sometimes he'd get a little short one, sometimes he would come up behind us and whack us in the legs with a long stick. The day was a day like any other day. My daughter was over and we were just going to take him for a quick run before supper. And we were coming back, we were almost out of the woods and he came up to me with his stick. We'd, I'd thrown the stick the whole time. He came up to me with his stick and um, I threw it one last time. And I looked to see where it was going to land. But I didn't watch it land. I didn't see, see it land, but I, I looked for where to make sure it was in an open space. We were almost out of the woods and River came running past us and we saw blood. And then he stopped and blood just gushed out of his mouth. He was heading home, but he stopped at one of the neighbors and went under a car and just laid there and blood was just gushing out of his mouth. And um, I sent my daughter running to the house to get Keith. You know, I thought maybe he had broken a leg or, or, or whatever. Um, I didn't know what to expect. And... We took him to the vet and he was pronounced dead. The whole thing just sort of played out so rapidly and so quickly that, you know, it was something that we were totally shocked by. The um, vet said that the stick went through his tongue and probably hit an artery. Ribby, what have you got? I walk every single morning and uh, he's always on my mind. But that next morning, I thought, what can we do to maybe, oh, I don't know, make the tragic situation somewhat better? And I, I thought, Let, let's get the word out. Afterwards, I did a lot of research. I Googled it. I looked up things. I looked up vets' opinions. And so many stories of dogs being hurt very badly. On that morning walk, that next day, I came up with a slogan in my mind. I said, dogs and sticks don't mix. Not trying to tell people what to do, but just sort of sharing our experience and somewhat of a warning, just, just to be careful. The, these things can happen so quickly. I surprised my 
myself because I actually wanted another puppy right away, but Keith wasn't ready. It was a tough one for me. But, you know, I, I also felt just like Linda did that there was a hole in her heart. He's brought a lot of new joy to our life. He's been, yeah, he's been good. You know, we're just looking at, again, nurturing this dog and, and, and really trying to, you know, give him a good home and give him a good life. And, uh, and that's, I think, all a pet owner can do. If I told you we were about to meet a mob of kangaroos and wallabies, where would you think our next feature takes place? Believe it or not, we're not headed down under, but to a hobby farm in Kelowna, BC. This is our 10th year since the very beginning of the farm at our previous location, our second year at the new location here at uh, Old Vernon Road. So the most unique thing about our facility is the fully interactivity with the animals. Um, when we're open, treats are provided to feed the, all the kangaroos, all the wallabies, and any other animal who would like to have a treat. All the animals are free reign. As you can see, the staff back here, highly motivated, hardworking. And they're typically, this is the afternoon behavior with the, uh, the wallabies. We have red kangaroos, which is the largest species, of which we have 16 or 17. We have Bennett wallabies, the ones surrounding me right now. Also, we have capybaras, aggravating chickens, peacocks, of course, which are very popular this time of year. The peacocks are displaying regularly, so they're a great attraction. We have currently four, five, or six pregnant females, or with joey females. And if you're lucky, you get to see the joeys poking their heads out uh, quite often now as they're getting larger and larger. After giving birth, the joey climbs into the pouch and spends about five months growing. After about five to six months, the joey does move out of the pouch pretty much permanently, but does stay with mom for up to a year, feeding from the pouch, keeping its nutrition needs from the milk that mother provides as it transitions to grazing off the grass. A unique thing for kangaroo reproduction is that at all times, typically the females are carrying a joey at some stage of development. Here comes Violet, our oldest. <laughs> Violet, the oldest female here, is now 12 years old and hasn't had a joey in several years. They stop producing typically about 10 or 11 years of age. The interaction between the people and the kangaroos, which are all hand raised, is a calm, friendly society. They consider us part of their mob. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Spotlight Features. If you'd like to see more great stories from your community or from across the country, follow us on social media or check out our website at shawspotlight.ca. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and give your fuzzy friends some extra lovin'.